Before you can read another language, you have to create a grammar. Therefore, we have to have theories. We have to develop techniques. By Clyde's bonny banks, where I sadly did wander, among the pit heaps as evening drew nigh. Ewan was in theatre, and this was, we used a lot of theatre techniques, because we were, we were training performers. We learned ways of coming on stage, going off stage, what to do with your instruments when you... We, learned, we had an entire six months on accompaniment, on things that help the song, things that harm the song. The Peggy Seeger complained because I didn't wear any makeup. She insisted I should wear makeup, which I've never done before or since, I might tell you. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> she put this makeup on me. She says, you don't, you know, you don't look right without it. So I was made up for this concert, and I felt like a... I don't know, a puppet or a marionette or something, a clown. I didn't feel like me, anyways. We booked Ewan and Peggy to come along to give us a weekend um, how to be a folk singer. Ewan and Peggy said, look, this is the sort of stuff you should be listening to and performing. And they played us tapes. When the wind blows, These really were the people who were recorded in their kitchens. They were singing unaccompanied. They were singing with great sincerity and a complete um, uh, lack of commerciality. Ewan at the same time was also playing, um, there was one particular recording he really enjoyed, which was of um, uh, an Azerbaijani singer who would be a Muslim singer, singing in a very, very um, ornamented way. And Ewan was quite keen that people should take the old English songs, the sort of songs that had been collected by people like Cecil Sharp, Vaughan Williams, uh, Percy Granger, and sing them using these um, highly ornamented techniques. <laughs> Well, he, he was, he was uh, um, very set, he always struck me as being very set in his ways. I think that this came from writing plays and so on, that he had, that he'd already made up a lot of his mind about a lot of things beforehand. That was, that was one of his difficulties. At the same time, he worked so hard on everything that, that he hadn't really got time for people who, who wanted to discuss, you know, or didn't agree with him. He really hadn't got time for them. I had always thought that McCall was just hijacking English or British folk music for his own political ends, and I minded that. It didn't belong to him, it belonged to, you know, ordinary working-class people, of which I was one, and I wanted to keep it that way. One working-class community totally unconcerned with the debates raging around folk music came from a nation where traditional music still had a voice. The immigrant Irish could be found socialising to the sounds of master musicians playing in pubs across North London every night. At that time, Camden Town, there was four or five pubs which were Irish pubs, Irish landlords, and they were for the Irish exiles who were over here. And I was taken into this pub, the Bedford Arms, and it was a social gathering. The men were dressed for a Saturday night in their suits and everything. And... Um, and then in the corner, the, these musicians playing, and there's the centre around Michael Gorman. The Bedford really kicks in in the mid 50s. Michael Gorman, just retired from being a porter in Liverpool Station, pals up with Margaret Barry as partners in life as well as partners in music and they hold sway there two or three nights a week and it was the cream. Michael Gorman was the top fiddle player, I would have thought, in the world then. Michael Gorman was a very typical slanger, um, small farming man. Shy, reserved, 
full of himself. And that, that's one of the great things that is this, they hold these two values. They know how good they are, but they're completely and utterly self-effacing. Casey was one of those people who came over and he did labouring. He came from Clare, a different tradition from Michael Gorman, and he had the most amazing bowing tricks and rhythmic tricks and his pitching and he could just play a, a note just slightly off pitch and the hair would go up on the back of his neck. Soulful music, lonesome music. They were beautiful people, and, and the thing is that, yes, they were over here working. There's all these talented people who were working, you know, that came here economically, and yet they had this incredible talent, you know. They weren't just paddies. While the emigrant Irish musicians were playing without fanfare in the pubs of London, by contrast, north of the border, BBC Scotland had a remit to put traditional Scottish music on television. Scottish television ran these sort of white heather club things where they had all these people jumping around and things. And, and they did these, you know those shows where you have um, sort of brown stuff in a glass? It's supposed to be beer, and everybody's... They're sort of Kayleigh idea. Well, now, James, we're going to have a dance. Would you, would you like to play for us? You know the Duke of Perth? Do I know the Duke of Perth? No, but I've met the Laird the Wachter Macht. <laughs> well, it's a real... Oh, it's a real. That's the real thing. Ladies and gentlemen, would you take your part... It became very much ball. kind of Scottish vaudeville, music hall type thing. And then you, you had the tenor soprano um, up, approach to the whole thing, where the, the music was taken and placed into what to me was an alien context. Um, classically trained, you know, people who should have been singing Schubert uh, was, was singing these Scottish songs. I think the breakthrough in that came in the 50s with people like Robin Hall and Jim McGregor. What they were doing was revolutionary. Oh, my name is Mick McGuire and I quickly tell to you... They were singing real songs on television. She was fair and fat and forty and believe me when I say that whenever I come in at the door you can hear her mommy say... I'm an urban Glaswegian, a working class urban Glaswegian. The only way I would ever describe myself as a traditional singer is when I was singing these little Glasgow street songs, which came from my own background. We've had a lot of complaints in the past two days. We haven't shown you Robin Hall and Jimmy McGregor. We now rectify the error. Three crows sat upon a wall, sat upon a wall, sat upon a wall. By the end of the 50s, millions of people were watching a family-friendly version of folk music on national television most nights of the week. But simultaneously, Ewan McCall had also managed to find a route into the heart of the BBC. The radio ballads were the realisation of all McCall's ideas, passions and beliefs, finally bringing together art and ideology to honour the working man. We present The Ballad of John Exon, the real-life story of a railwayman told by the men who knew him and worked with him and set into song by Ewan McCall. The Ballad of John Axon was the one that, as it were, broke the mould of the way it had been done previously and set the, the mould for what would be done subsequently. It began with Peggy's banjo, bing da ling da ling da ling da ling and then Ewan singing John Axon was a rare woman, uh, in the style of the old heroic ballads. John Axon was a railway man to steam trains born and bred. But then a voice, an official BBC announcer, an gave the findings of the uh, Commission of Inquiry into the rail crash. And suddenly you got this mixture of reality and 
heroic myth. I regret to report that driver Axon and the guard of the Rosalie freight train were killed.